Okay, it, you know, we're right at 10 o'clock, so we'll, we'll get started and, and hopefully a few more people will join us here in a minute or so. Um, for those of you who, do, who don't know who I am, I'm Karen Mayfield. I'm the Executive Director of CAI West Florida, and it is our group that is putting on this presentation today. The three presenters that we have are longtime members, and they, they actually do a lot for me, um, for, our, for our chapter. They volunteer a lot of their time and expertise, so for that, I'm very grateful. A couple of housekeeping items. Um, make sure that you're logged in um, so I know who you are. If you are logged in as, you know, owner or by phone number or something, um, I really don't know who you are. First name, I might not know who you are. So um, in the chat feature, send me um, a, a chat that tells me who you are. Um, you know, there's a mic and a Daryl. I just need to make sure I know. And Bill S., I need to know your last name, Bill. Um, you know, it, it, you can go to the uh, participant on the bottom of your um, screen and click on that and go to your name and under more, you can rename yourself. And if you do that, that works for me when I pull the, the list at the end of the program for the certificates, um, that's what pulls is where your names are um, as you're logged in. The other thing is, is if you have questions, please use the chat feature. Um, the, each presentation is a half an hour and we're gonna, the, each presenter is gonna present between 20 and 25 minutes on their session. And then we're gonna stop and we're gonna answer questions. So I will monitor the chat feature. Don't raise your hand, don't use the Q&A, but use the chat. Um, so with that being said, I'm gonna introduce everyone. The first speaker today that's gonna do statutes and governing documents is Bryony Swift. She's an attorney um, with Porges, Hamlin, Knowles and Hawk in Bradenton. Uh, second topic is uh, uh, elections, and the third topic is budgets and reserves, financial requirements. And Bill Ashby um, with Gulf Coast Community Management is going to present those two topics. And Bill is president of our um, association this year. So you're going to hear it from the expert, the president of the chapter. And the last speaker, um, and is Mary Hawk, and she is an attorney with Porges Hamlin, Knowles and Hawk. And um, B Mary is a past president and also a current board member. So you guys are in for a treat today. And with that being said, Bryony, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in this morning. Is that the right terminology for Zoom? I'm not sure. Um, as Karen said, I am Bryony Swift, and I'm going to give you an overview of statutes, governing documents, and resources for HOAs. Now, Florida has three main types of real property ownership. In a condo, you own a box of air, and you share ownership of the common elements with other members of the condominium. And that's Chapter 718 of the Florida Statutes. Uh, chapter 719 is cooperative ownership. You own a share in an entity that owns a residential community and ownership of the share brings with it a dwelling. That's 719. And then the third, the one we're here to discuss today is chapter 720. Um, that's the HOA form of ownership. You own a dwelling and the land on which it sits in accordance with a recorded declaration of covenants. And that declaration of covenants was recorded by a common owner. So one singular owner, usually a developer or a declarant, who owns a large parcel of land, plots a community, and records a declaration of covenants, conditions, and restrictions. And there can be varieties on that name, but C, C, and R, as it's sometimes abbreviated, covenants, conditions, and restrictions is the, the most likely name of that document. Um, there can be more than one original owner when the community is platted, but in that case, all owners join together and they sign joiners to all bring their land within the declaration. Once that declaration is recorded, that declaration of covenants is a contract running with the land, binding all owners who purchase property in that community. And that type of community is governed by Chapter 720 of the Florida Statutes. That's the Homeowners Association Act. 
the Homeowners Association Act and all the other Florida statutes are readily available online at either the Florida Legislature's webpage, which is online sunshine, that's leg.state.fl.us slash statutes, or on the Florida Senate's webpage, that's flsenate.gov. As a director of a homeowners association, you should be aware of the Homeowners Association Act, Chapter 720, be familiar with your association's governing documents, and have an understanding of how the act and the governing documents both impact the decisions that you make while you're serving on the board. As a director of a homeowners association, you're a fiduciary. You have a fiduciary duty to act in the best interests of your community with the care of a reasonably prudent person. And a reasonably prudent person would take one of these classes, so you're on the right track. Um, first, starting with Chapter 720, there are three parts of the Homeowners Association Act. The first section is general powers, and that's going to be the most useful section for your purposes. Section two pertains to home sales, and part three addresses revitalization of covenants. And I will touch briefly on revitalization of covenants at the end of this presentation. In your outline on page three, it lists several important definitions, which are found in Florida statute 72301. And as an aside, 720 starts with 301 because the Homeowners Association Act used to be section three of the Not-for-Profit Corporation Act, and they just picked it up out of the Not-for-Profit Corporation Act and they dropped it into 720 and they left the numbers. So it starts at 301. 301 important definitions are listed in your outline, but I'll summarize a few of them. Assessments means money payable to the association by the owners as authorized by the governing documents. Common area means real property dedicated for the use or maintenance by the association or its members. A declaration of covenants means the written covenants running with the land. Governing documents means the declaration of covenants, but it also means the articles of incorporation for the entity that is the association, the bylaws of the association, and the rules and regulations for the association, if there are any, as well as any amendments to any of those documents. And the definition of homeowners association, that's a Florida corporation responsible for the operation of a community in which the membership is made up of parcel owners and membership is mandatory. Your outline gives you a list of important sections of chapter 720, the HOA Act. You should look them over, but I don't expect you to read through all of them. It would probably put you to sleep. So I'm going to tell you the most useful sections for your purposes. I would say the most important section to review would be 72303 that covers association powers and duties. 72303 covers board meetings, notice of board meetings, taking minutes at board meetings, retaining official records of the association. It explains what documents are official records of the association and it explains the association's records retention obligations. It addresses unit owner requests for access to official records of the association and penalties or possible penalties for, for refusal to grant access to official records of the association. Uh, 72303 also covers budgets, reserves, financial records, and recalls. It's lengthy. You don't need to read it all at once. You can break it into sections. Uh, but it is going to be the most useful statute for you to review uh, pertaining to your duties as a board member. Second statute I would suggest you review is much shorter, but more complicated. That's uh, 72305. That concerns the legal obligations of members to follow the statutes and the governing documents. It also addresses the levy of fines and the suspension of use rights for violation of the covenants. Now, the statutory process for the levy of fines is complicated. It's complicated in the statute, and then there's also constitutional implications 
of due process, and there are civil procedure rules that impact the, the timelines in that statute. So if your board wants to levy fines, I recommend reaching out to council to make sure you're properly following the processes, but definitely look over Florida statute 72305 to see what the association's powers are and before you begin the fine process. The third section that I would say is particularly important is 72306. That covers um, membership meetings, quorum, amendments to the documents, notice of membership meetings, notice to mortgage holders, and proxy voting. Um, next, I'll go more in depth concerning governing documents. As I mentioned before, the governing documents are the declaration, the articles of incorporation, the bylaws, and the rules and regulations for the association, if there are any, as well as any amendments to any of those documents. Governing documents are part of the official records of the association. Every director should have a complete set of governing documents. And um, most associations nowadays have their governing documents on their website and available in PDF form so that they can easily provide copies of the governing documents to members. Uh, in the, there's a hierarchy of governing documents so if there's a, a, a contradiction, there, there is a hierarchy that says which document will prevail. In the, in the hierarchy of governing documents, the declaration is the first, the highest priority. It is the association's constitution, so to speak, and it is a contract between the owners and the association spelling out the rights and responsibilities of both. So when you review the declaration, there may be some provisions that seem superfluous, provisions about SWIFMA, the water management districts, and provisions about recorded easements. Those do need to be in there. Um, I have had associations ask if I can delete those things for them. No, they, they are required to be there, um, but feel free to skim those sections. Um, for your purposes as a board member, you want to pay particular attention to the formula and the requirement for assessments. Not every association calculates their assessments the same way. There's going to be a formula spelled out in your declaration and you have to follow that formula and that formula cannot be changed. Um, well, it could be changed, I suppose, with 100% agreement, but 100% agreement is impossible to get. So the formula and the requirements are going to stay, to stay constant. Um, the next section you want to pay particular attention to is the, uh, the budget and reserve requirements, uh, whether your declaration requires you to reserve for specific items and what your budget obligations are. But as I mentioned earlier, budgets are also addressed in the statutes. So you want to make sure that you are in conformity with both the statutes that I mentioned earlier and your governing documents. Um, you want to look in your declaration at restrictions on sale or leasing requirements, uh, whether an owner needs approval from the association before they sell their property, whether an owner can lease their home and what the requirements are for submitting a lease application and getting approval from the association for their tenant or whether your association has no restrictions on sale or, or any leasing requirements. You also want to pay particular attention to your maintenance obligations. In the declaration, some communities have provide maintenance for their unit owners as part of their assessments. Um, some spell out specific maintenance obligations for the unit owners and the association. You want to have a a clear understanding of what the maintenance obligations are as spelled out in your declaration so that when you look around your community, you can see who's following the covenants and who's not. Uh, because that the last um, section I'd ask you to pay particular attention to, that's use restrictions. That is the section that says what a, a unit or a homeowner can and cannot do. Um, on the common elements and sometimes on their lot as well. 
Um, different declarations have different scopes. Some will not, um, some use restrictions apply only to common areas. So have a look and, and understand what the specific use restrictions are for your community. And those five sections should cover most of the issues that the board will face on a day-to-day -day basis. If the association is also subject to a master association, that should also be disclosed in the declaration, usually right in the beginning. Um, so in the, in the hierarchy of governing documents, the Articles of Incorporation are next. They are the, the second highest priority. The Articles of Incorporation establish the association entity. They are recorded with the Division of Corporations when the community is originally founded. Generally, they don't impact the day-to-day -day operations of the association. Uh, modern articles of incorporation are very general. However, maybe 50 years ago, it was commonplace to state the powers and processes of the entity in the articles of incorporation specifically. And so in older associations, you may have articles of incorporation that also do impact the day-to-day -day operations of your association. If it's a newer community, the articles generally won't impact the day-to-day -day operations. Um, now it's commonplace to record very general articles of incorporation and just give the entity broad powers and that way you never run into any discrepancies. With an older community, you can have discrepancies between the powers stated in the Articles of Incorporation and the powers stated in the bylaws. And if there is a discrepancy, then the Articles of Incorporation would prevail over the terms of the bylaws. The bylaws are the third in the hierarchy of governing documents. The bylaws set forth the processes and procedures for operation of the association entity. Usually the bylaws will contain provisions um, dictating the number of directors, the officer positions in, within the association. I know some, some associations will only have four officer provisions. Some will have as many as six or seven. Um, and the bylaws will give you the election processes. Now you may recall Two of those important statutes I mentioned a few minutes ago, that's uh, 720.303 and 720.306. Those also contain provisions relating to the processes and procedures for operation of your association. Those statutes can impact your bylaws and the operation of your entity. Both of those statutes contain sections that begin with the bylaws shall provide, or provisions that begin with unless otherwise provided in the bylaws. And those, um, those little tags, those, that language, will impact your bylaws. It will allow your bylaws to depart from the statutory framework, or it will impose the statutory framework over what you have in your bylaws. So you want to look at your bylaws, but also those two statutes, 720.303 and 720.306 to decide whether your bylaws or the statute is going to impact the um, action of your board. And of course, you can certainly contact counsel to inquire. Um, but as an example, in 720.303 subsection 12, that section prohibits a director from being paid a salary unless compensation is authorized by the association bylaws. So if the bylaws are completely silent on the subject, a, a board member cannot be paid a salary, but some bylaws, especially older bylaws will allow some form of compensation. So you want to check both places, the statute and the declaration or reach out to council. If your association is an older association and it has never amended its bylaws, 
there may be mandatory provisions as more likely to be mandatory provisions of section 72303 and 72306 that will override your bylaws. I'm thinking specifically of um, budgets and budgetary reporting there. Um, the fourth in the hierarchy of governing documents are the board made rules and regulations of the association. Now, boards can make rules, but rules must be reasonable and the rules must fall within the scope of power granted by the declaration. I'll give you an example to try and make this clearer. Um, you have a board member who doesn't like Pomeranian dogs. They want to pass a rule prohibiting owners from owning Pomeranians in the community. But the governing documents don't grant the association the right to regulate pets in any way. Oh, I see a, a question in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, older communities is a relative term. We have communities that are, are 50 and 60 years old. Oh no, I wouldn't consider a 20 year old community an older community. I would consider a, maybe a 30 year old community through the 50 and 60 year old communities is what I'm thinking of when I say older communities. All right, we were prohibiting Pomeranians. Um, so a rule, rules and regulations must be reasonable and fall within the scope of power granted by the declaration. If the declaration doesn't give the association the power to regulate pets in any way, then the association does not have the power to pass a rule prohibiting Pomeranians. And we don't even get to the question of whether it's reasonable to prohibit a specific breed of dog because this association doesn't have the right to restrict the type of dogs or restrict pets in any way their declaration didn't grant that power to the association and to the board so it's a power retained by the owner um, the declaration is a contract as i said running with the land which dictates the rights of the owners to in dealing with each other in dealing with their land and in dealing with the association um, so that's rules and regulations that's fourth in the hierarchy of governing documents um, you should also be familiar in a general sense with the plats of your community. Plats show boundaries and easements as well as improvements and common areas of the community. A review of the plat will give you a better understanding of the common areas and easements within the community. And it, it just gives you a better understanding of the scope of your responsibility as a board member. And at the beginning of this presentation, presentation, I mentioned that I would touch on part three of chapter 720. Um, that is the Marketable Record Title Act. That's chapter 712 of the Florida statutes. And this, um, the Marketable Record Title Act, we call it MARTA. Um, and it gives some lawyers headaches. So if I, if I put you to sleep or give you a headache, trust me, it'll be over soon. Um, section three of the Homeowners Association Act 720, section 403 through 407 also pertains to the Marketable Record Title Act. Uh, rules and regulations do need, there's a, sorry, sorry for the aside, there, a comment just popped up in the chat. Um, the Florida statutes were changed, I believe in seven, or in uh, 2018 to require recording of your rules and regulations. Your rules and regulations, if they weren't recorded prior to that, are still, they're still binding. Um, and it was actually um, a legislative error that made recording of rules and regulations required under the statute. And the legislature is supposed to be fixing that because um, the statutory scheme didn't consider requiring um, the recording of the rules and regulations. Somebody decided to tweak a definition and it had um, the impact cascaded through other 
statutes that use that definition. So I know that's a long answer to what looked like an easy question, um, but yes, the statute currently requires recording of rules and regulations. No, they didn't mean to make it do that and they are planning to fix it. Um, so back to the Marketable Record Title Act. Um, MARTA was enacted to clear old encumbrances from chains of title. It was meant to make title searches easy and clean, uh, but it accidentally also impacted homeowners associations. It stems from the Great Depression, lands were seized for taxes, then after the Depression, some of those debts were forgiven, some of those lands were returned, and as a result, land titles were a mess. So the title industry said, let's just disregard all the old things in the title searches. Um, and the legislature enacted MARTA. It clears um, encumbrances that are at least 30 years older than the time when marketability is being determined. And that includes uh, your declaration of covenants. It's confusing, I know. But what you need to know is if your declaration was recorded more than 25 years ago, you want to talk to your association attorney to make sure your declaration has been properly preserved under the statutes. So an association can record a notice of preservation and that extends that MARTA expiration date for another 30 years. If your declaration has expired under MARTA, there is a process to bring your covenants back to life um, it requires a vote of the former membership and approval of the DBPR. And DBPR is the Division of Business and Professional Regulation. Generally, they serve uh, condominium and cooperative communities, but they're also involved in covenant revitalization as well as HOA election or recall disputes. And your board is obligated by statute to discuss MARTA once per year at the very first board meeting after the annual membership meeting, excluding the organizational meeting. So at the first meeting of the board, you're obligated to discuss MARTA. And I'm hoping that discussion is, we've already taken care of it. We don't have to worry about it for another 20 years. Uh, but you are obligated to at least look at MARTA to make sure that you get your covenants timely preserved so that they don't expire. I see Karen and Bill have returned, so. We have, yeah, the, the half an hour went really fast, but I wanna ask, I know you were answering questions as you were going along. Um, does anybody have any other questions for Bryony about um, governing documents or, or anything? Are plat maps recorded with the county and what division? Uh, yes, plat maps, plat maps are recorded by the county. Um, they are generally in the property records, but some counties will keep their own separate plat records. So when you go to the official records of the county, there's usually a plat book that you can click on to search for your community name. Okay. Are there any other questions? Because if not, you're going to lose her. <laughs> we can find her again, though. <laughs> All right, Brady. I appreciate it so much. Have a great day. Thanks, you too. Okay, Bill, we're ready for you. You can come back on. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the uh, for the class there, Brian. That was great. And I want to thank uh, take a moment to thank all of the homeowners who have registered for this class. I think it shows uh, all the well-run um, HOA boards and condo boards are a result of homeowners taking classes like this so you can have better knowledge to run your association. So, Bill, that, can, I, uh, can I stop you before you get started here? Yeah, right. yeah go ahead. I have, I have one person that is logged in um, with a phone number, 941-932-5728. Uh, I don't know who you are. So um, could you please send me an email and let me know who you are so I can make sure you get a certificate after the program. So that's all I've got everybody else. So with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute and go. You can start.
All right, great. Okay, so, um, so what I'll be talking about today, at least for the first, uh, the second topic, is uh, homeowner association operations uh, for elections, the requirements and best practices, and association records and meetings. So, this is a mouthful uh, to get this uh, to go through this. So, this will be a very brief overview of the process. And as you'll hear, as you've already heard from the from Brandy and the next Mary that um, the governing documents must be consulted um, in the bylaws, especially to make sure that you are doing per your what your governing documents are requiring you to do in the election process. And I'll make some references about that as we move forward. So before the election, any well ran election needs to be planned ahead of time. And the reference that I want to give you for the for Florida Statute 720 is 720.306, and that refers to the election process. So when you have a, an election, before scheduling your annual meeting and election, first you need to reference your governing documents and the bylaws and determine if your documents refer to any specific timelines and dates that are required to notice the meeting. Some associations require a hard deadline of 30 day notice. Some require not more than 60, um, but please refer to your governing documents about that. So when you're scheduling your annual meeting and election, make sure after you've consulted and you've determined the notice that's needed, then start counting backwards from the day before the election to determine your deadlines for when you're going to send out your notices. So that's the first step that you need to do. Um, second thing will be to gather all the documents you're going to need for the election. You want to get a complete owner roster. You want to make sure that any amendments or anything that you're voting on at the annual meeting, you have that ready to go from your attorney. Um, your agenda, your minutes from the previous year that the uh, owners need to approve, make sure all of that is together. And then possibly begin asking homeowners in the community that are not on the board or related to anybody on the board to serve as an election monitor. So you could at least have those owners volunteered, so to speak, uh, before the annual meeting gets there. So now that we have all that information set, now we need to talk about the notices. So in the Florida Statute 720, it's in 306, it states that if you're governing documents or your bylaws are silent regarding the notice, then the HOA process, the meeting must be noticed 14 days in advance. So most, most governing documents refer to just a 14 day notice. Some governing documents will state that there are, you must note the first notice no sooner than 60 days before the election. So it really has, you really have to consult your documents. And if you need any help determining that, you should contact your attorney and they will help guide you through looking at your bylaws to determine how you could uh, notice your meeting. So if your document states that you can note or you give your owners an opportunity to be a candidate prior to the annual meeting, that will create a whole different timeline for you to begin to seek nominations uh, from your members who want to run for the floor. If you allow your candidates or your owners to self-nominate prior to the annual meeting, then Statute 720 states that you do not, you're not necessarily required to allow for nominations from the floor at the meeting. And again, if you have any questions about this, please just you know, consult with your attorney about the exact process that you could do that with. So. Quorum, let's discuss the uh, quorum. Uh, first, let, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead of myself. So let's talk about uh, documenting the process of sending out your notices. So there's an affidavit of mailing. I'm sure that you've heard that. Um, if you've served on the board previously, um, the notice of meeting or the proof of notice is an affidavit that whoever, whomever is providing the mailing, whether it be the property manager, the secretary, or anybody on the board, if you are self-managed, there should be an, an affidavit document that you sign that um, stating the date that the mailing went out. And you should do that for all of your notices that are sent out if you're required to do.
Bill, I hope you can hear me. You froze up and you're gone. So you need to maybe refresh your connection. I apologize, everyone. Um, we'll get this back on track. Give us just a second. I just texted Bill um, to try to get him back here. So <laughs> we'll get him back hopefully here in just a second. Oh no. Um, their, in their internet just, Bill's, Bill's internet just went out. Okay. Mary, are you there by any chance? Yes. Would you be able to start your session um, now? Bill's internet went out and hopefully by the time you finish um, competitive bids and contracts, he'll be back on. Okay, I can jump in on uh, elections too if he's not back. <laughs> okay, let's start right. with your, your section, competitive bids and contracts and I'll monitor a half an hour and I'll text him and let him know that you're doing competitive bids and come back on when he can. Wait, here he is. Yes. Okay. You're back on, Bill? Hey, I might have uh, want to apologize to everybody. Sorry about that. We must have had a glitch. Our entire system went down and with our internet. So I apologize for that. So I'll get started here. Karen, can you give me um, a, an idea of the last thing that everybody heard? I think um, you were talking about notices, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so let's just pick it up right there. So, thank you, Mary. Mary was going to take over, Bill, but now that you're back, I uh, thank you, Mary. I may need you again if he if it happens to him again. Okay. Yep, thank you, Mary. Sorry about that, everybody. Again, my apologies for the uh, internet outage there. That was brief. So. Um, so the notice of proof of notice, I'm, I'm just quickly go through this just in case it wasn't, uh, you guys didn't hear it. So when you're sending out your notices, whether you're self-managed or you have a property manager or even somebody on the board who does all the notices, an affidavit is required to show proof that notice was given. It's just a signed document stating that, yes, you uh, signed, sent um, all of the notices that were required, including to those owners that consented to receive them electronically via email. So now that you've sent out your notices and let's assume that you have asked your candidates to submit an intent to run form as well as an information sheet. So as those two documents come in or any documents that come in from the owners regarding the election, the candidates intent to run, the candidates information sheet, those should be time stamped and dated to let you know when they were received. So if there was ever an issue in the future about when you received those documents, you can have you can refer right back to them as when they came into your office. Um, the owner's response. So when, if anything is returned um, or their ballots or proxies are returned, there are a couple different ways that this should be handled. One, let's assume that um, you are allowed to vote by proxy at your meeting and that a ballot or a secret ballot is not required because your bylaws do not require you to do that. You can start opening your proxies and your, your proxy ballots prior to the annual meeting. There's nothing that you need to do except for to take those ballots and make sure they're open, then the management company or the self-managed board will be able to start to tally themselves and keep track of the ballots as they come in. If, for, for, if your bylaws require your ballot to be by secret, 
then you need to follow the instructions that are listed in your bylaws or which are generally the way that the condo associations do that. And that is there's an outer envelope and an inner, inner envelope. The inner envelope will contain your ballot or your secret ballot. Um, there should be no markings on the ballot. There should be no markings on the inner envelope except for the word ballot. And that is to ensure his secrecy. And then your outer envelope has the name of the association and a signature on the outside of the envelope on the outer envelope. And those are not to be open prior to the meeting. Those will be done at the meeting if your bylaws require you to vote um, in secret. So the night of the meeting. So you've done all of the things you've done, the notices have been sent out, and now you are ready to go for the meeting. So at the night, as everybody starts coming into the meetings, you want to have them sign in and confirm the people that are signing in if they have returned or they have returned their proxies prior. If they have, if you are collecting secret ballots, then the ballots with the outer envelope must be uh, given to the person who are doing the sign in. As you, everybody is ready to get everybody assigned in, then you need to determine if you have a quorum of the, of the membership. Now, Florida statute says that it is a 30% requirement or a quorum to have your annual meeting unless your bylaws state a lower number. So if your bylaws state that a quorum requirement is 50% of the owners, this is the time where the stat 720 would supersede your bylaws and say that, no, nope, even though your documents say 50%, it is now actually 30% that's required to have a quorum at a meeting. If your bylaws say 10% or 20%, then you can then defer to the lower number needed to have a quorum at whatever is stated in your proxy or in, in your bylaws. So if I just want to state this uh, quickly while we're talking about the quorum, if an HOA does not have a quorum at an annual meeting, and an election is not needed, then those people who have submitted their information or uh, to serve on the board are then still automatically elected to the board, regardless if you have an HOA annual meeting slash election. I just wanted to state that right there while we were talking about the quorum. So as you've collected all the ballots, proxies and or proxies, uh, now you're going to turn those over to the election committee, which would be some, the tellers who are going to count your uh, ballots and or proxies or confirm the numbers. So let's first start about if you had that vote by secret ballot. All previously received unopened secret ballots are then put in a pile. All of the outer envelopes are then opened and discarded to the side. And then all of the inner envelopes are then kept in a different pile and you open up all of those ballots at that time. Once you have opened up all of them and you have just have two different piles, your outer envelope and then your inner envelope, you then start opening up the inner envelopes and counting the ballots. They must be done separately and two different piles so as people to ensure the secrecy of the ballots received. If you're not doing secret ballot, then it's just an, to go through and start collecting all, or counting all of your proxy ballots to determine the outcome of the election. So now we are at the election. Um, the board, as I stated earlier, does not have to, what well, kind of jumped ahead there, but before you start counting, you know, when you, when you start, if your document states that you do not need to have nominations from the floor, or if they do state that, but you've given the owners in the community the opportunity to self-nominate prior to the annual meeting, then you need, you're not required to call nominations from the floor, but you still can do that as a board if you decide you want to do that. For those owners that are did not submit a proxy ballot and that a ballot is needed for those to vote, then on the ballot, you can have two or three lines for uh, nominations from the floor if people want to vote for those people. Uh, then you close the polls, and then this is when the tellers start beginning the count. 
And then you follow the process that I just stated about the secret ballot process versus the non-secret. Check the outer envelopes and ballots. Um, you do that in front of everybody in the room. And then once the tallies have been uh, certified by the committee or the, the election tellers, then that is, um, then they can announce to the board um, the number of votes for each candidate and how many votes were uh, disregarded. That information, depending on what your bylaw state, should be part of the official record for the election regarding the, um, not necessarily the number of votes, but your bylaws may state how long you are to keep the ballots, secret ballots and or proxies for the meeting. So let's talk, if you did not have uh, a quorum for the meeting, one thing that uh, you can do is postpone the meeting for up to 90 days. At the time in the meeting, if you do not have a quorum and the board is seated, you can, one of two things. One, you can announce the next scheduled meeting date for the members to resume the annual meeting no later than 90 days, within 90 days of the annual meeting and that will serve as a notice. If the board is unsure of when they're going to schedule the next meeting, then you must follow the notice procedure again by sending out a new notice of 14 days in advance to the owners, uh, announcing when the resumed annual meeting is going to occur. And then you just adjourn the meeting at the end of that. Now, immediately following the annual meeting and election, there's the new board of directors meeting. There will be a separate agenda Hold on just lost my place, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so there'll be a separate um, annual board meeting and that is called the organizational meeting. That is where you're going to elect slash appoint officers and this is done by the board of directors. So your board can simply just have a conversation at this meeting to determine who is going to be president, secretary, treasurer, vice president, if it's listed in your documents or simply a director. Um, you can start the process where the board members can appoint and have a vote if there are more than one person who wants to serve as president, secretary, or treasurer. And you follow that process until all of the officers are appointed or elected and approved to the board. Same time at the organizational meeting, if there's a changeover in the board, then you definitely want to appoint check signers. And once those check signers have been assigned and approved by the board, then obviously you need to contact your banking institution to begin the process of having the new check signers and the signature cards completed. Then the last thing you want to do at the organizational meeting is to confirm the regular meeting dates in place. Although that's not required to schedule out your meetings in advance, it's very good idea to determine whether or not you're going to meet every single month, every other month, quarterly, semi, how often you're going to meet to at least confirm the number of dates or number of times you're going to meet. Your bylaws may indicate exactly how many times you are to meet the month, whether it's quarterly at such a time, the third Tuesday. So please refer to your bylaws when you get to that point uh, to, the, to help you guide you as you move forward through that. So once the new board is seated and now you have 90 days um, to take a class as a board certification class as you're taking now, or to simply sign a document stating that there are, um, that you agree to abide by the association's rules and regulations. And there is verbiage that is in the statute 720.3033, and that will help guide you as to the information that's needed uh, to be included in the letter. But as I'm sure everybody who is, um, presenting this class today, that taking a board certification class from CAI gives you so much insight on the uh, on how to be a board member and what's expected of you as a board member. But this is definitely highly recommended to take this. So let's say that you are um, re-elected to the board and you've had no interruption of service in your tenure of serving on the board. You do not need to recertify to take a class again but I suggest that you take the class every single year. Um, the process may change um, as with the legislature, if they in, you know, interpreted new rules or added new rules. So it's always a good idea to do this every single year. If you were a board member previously and then set out a term or two, 
and then decided to rerun for the board, then you will need to recertify or to sign the document stating that you're going to follow the rules and regulations of the associations. So how long is that certification kept or that document kept? Five years after the director's election. Um, but if that document cannot be found, that does not invalidate any of the board's actions, previous actions. If you have a board member who has decided that they do not want to take the certification class or decides that they do not want to sign their document that they're going to uphold the rules of the association, after 90 days, the board, um, that person then is, is determined to have abandoned its position, his or her position, and the board uh, can remove them from the board and appoint a replacement, temporary replacement, until that board member has provided documentation that they've taken the certification class or if they have um, signed that document. So let's talk about records maintenance. Uh, I know that was a lot for the election, um, but this is just a brief overview, but now we want to talk about uh, records maintenance. Hey Bill, you've got a lot of questions on the side here. Can we answer yeah, sure. before you move on? Yeah, go ahead. The first question is, is there a specific prohibition about husband and wife serving on a board at the same time? Well, um, there, you cannot have the same person serve or an husband and wife serve on the board or a married couple serve on the board at the same time that they own one property. But I believe I'll defer to the attorneys um, that are on the call. I think in the condo world, I believe that if there is no one else able to serve, I believe that they can do that. But I, that, that would be a legal question that needs to be interpreted by uh, Mary. So I think Mary just- You are correct. Okay. And that is the same for both HOA and condo, correct, Mary? I think so. I know it's, yeah. it's right for condo. Yep. But that would be an extreme case that um, you could not get anybody to serve on the board. Okay. Is a check required? Is a check required that name on envelope is the assigned designated voter? Does that make sense? Yes. So um, if there are, if the property is owned by two or more people, then there should be a voting certificate on file indicating which person has a right to vote. Yeah. If that person, if there is no voting certificate on file and one of the owners have voted, then that person is allowed to vote. But what you don't want to, the problem exists or becomes a problem when two people who are owners of a property have submitted a vote. And that is why you need to check the name on the outside. Um. How are HOAs handling annual meetings and elections during COVID? So um, I'm fortunate right now that we have not had any associations uh, hold an annual meeting uh, during Zoom. Um, but for those that we are about to have annual meetings, the same process occurs. Nothing is different. You are just having your, so let's say that you are having an, an election because that would be a, a big topic to address during uh how are you going to count the votes in front of people? Then there would have to be a room reserved, whether it's at the management company's office or your, um, or your community center that has a camera on the people who are counting the ballots or a camera on the people that are opening the outer envelope versus the inner envelope. So that still has to be on video because the homeowners still need to be able to see that. So if you are having an issue with that or have any questions, again, see if you're, uh, your attorney's counsel. This is new for them as well because this is something that no one's really discussed having. So you can uh, get with your attorney and they can help help you with that. Okay, uh, next question. If a quorum is not met at annual meeting, what would be a reasonable remedy and amendment in the governing documents? Uh, so I'm assuming you're asking if you don't get a quorum or a quorum is too high than 30%, let's say, because obviously we just said that the 30% is the quorum. If you have a 1500 community and 30% is still the number, in order for you to get that quorum lower, then you do have to have your documents amended if you want to change it to 10% or whatever lower than 30%. That still needs to be approved by the membership. 
So you would have to reference your documents to determine the percentage needed to have an amendment done and uh, have your attorney draft a draft version and then send that out um, to the owners for a vote at a future membership meeting. Now, you may have already answered this, I'm not sure, but this is the last question we have. If a quorum is not achieved at a meet and meeting is paused, are the ballots that have been timely submitted retained and counted once the quorum is obtained? No further ballots accepted during the pause, correct? Yes, that is correct. So when, after you've done a call for the floor for all the ballots and the proxies that where somebody came with their proxy, and once you've asked for that and called for those, then the board then would close that. So no future ballot, no additional ballots can be obtained if the meeting progresses. If for some reason that a quorum is not achieved and that your question, yes, you can get additional ballots and or proxies because that is what you want to do to get a quorum for the meeting. And so, yes, you can do that, but um, you would not begin counting the ballots for any election or any measure that's to be voted by the membership at a membership meeting, unless you had quorum. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, that was the last question. I was sorry to interrupt you, but I didn't no, sorry. let those go. So um, right. go ahead and continue. All right, so just have a, a few more minutes um, on the records maintenance. And we also have to talk about the uh, board meetings moving forward. So. The definition of official records, um, the Homeowner Act um, 720 has specific definition of what official records must be maintained by the association. And I'll just scroll through the um, items listed and you can find these under section 720.303 subsection number four. And that is indicated in your outline that you receive when you register for the meeting. So copies of plans, specifications, permits and warranties related to improvements, copy of the bylaws, of the association in each amendment, the same for the Articles of Incorporation and Declaration of Covenants. Oh no, it looks like Bill's having trouble again. I um Okay. It just his internet just went out again. Mary, I apologize. Can you go ahead and start the last session? I'm sorry everyone for these glitches. Yeah, let me rearrange my papers here. <laughs> okay. So we'll do, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, we'll do topic four in your um, handout, competitive bids and contracts for homeowners associations. It's actually all different kinds of contracts for homeowners associations. Um, it starts with certain contracts for homeowners associations that must be in writing. The uh, kinds of contracts that you must get in writing 
include any contract that is not to be fully performed within one year after the making of the contract for the purchase, lease, renting of materials or equipment or um, services to the association and all contracts for the provision of services shall be in writing. Um, and I know you had a question earlier about the rules and regulations now having to be um, recorded and the glitch in the uh, legislation considers your rules and regulations to be part of your um, governing documents. So if you have any contracts that are going to be performed that cannot be fully performed within one year or our contracts for the provision of services pursuant to some um, provision of your rules and regulations, declaration, articles, bylaws, you have to have those contracts in writing. The biggest question we usually get from HOAs is when must you go out for competitive bids for contracts? Um, so the statute, and it's in your, in your handout 723.055, says a contract for the purchase, lease, or renting of materials or equipment or for the provision of services that requires payment by the association that exceeds 10% of the total budget of the association, including reserves, you must obtain competitive bids. So you must get bids for contracts basically that exceed, that will exceed 10% of your total budget, including reserves. Um, there's nothing in the statute that legally requires you to accept the lowest bid um, unless it's in your governing documents that you must. And also by getting competitive bids under the statute, it means obtaining more than one bid. But you'll want to check your governing documents to make sure that your governing documents don't require you to get three or more bids. Um, and you cannot opt out of the statute requiring these competitive bids. Um, there, but there are some exceptions. There are some um, contracts that are not subject to competitive bids, um, including contracts with employees of the association and employees are specifically um, employees of the association where you deduct taxes and unemployment compensation and withholding. It's an actual employee. So if it's, if it's not a, it's a, a, not an employee or a, um, a, just a contract worker, um, then they would still be com subject to competitive bids. But if you have an actual employee of the, of the association, that contract's not a, subject to competitive bids. Also not subject to competitive bids are contracts for the attorney, accountant, architect, community association manager, engineering or landscape architect services. So those services are not subject to the competitive bid requirement. There is a little sentence thrown in the law that says, if you did go out for competitive bids for your community association manager contract, then you can have a contract of up to three years. Uh, if you did not go out for competitive bid by implication, you can have a one or two year community manager contract. Um, competitive bidding does not apply um, when you need, the association needs products or services during an emergency, doesn't really define emergency. Um, we've been in a state of emergency since last March with the pandemic, so uh, I don't think that's what they had in mind, um, but you keep it in mind, it may be that you can get some services and products during a state of emergency without having to go through the competitive bids. It's not advisable, but um, it's in there. You don't also do not need to go out for competitive bids if what you're trying to, to obtain the service or the product, there's only one source of supply of that in the county in which the association is located. Also, if you have some really long-term contract that was executed before October 1st, 2004, then that contract and any renewal of that contract is not subject to competitive bid requirement either. Um, you'll want to look carefully at these uh, contracts that you do get, obtain by competitive bid. Look carefully at the renewal provisions and the cancellation provisions in those contracts. And if it's a contract that required a competitive bid, it's a big money contract likely, and we do recommend you ask your attorney to review it 
Um, we've seen a lot of people wanting to go out for some contracts recently with some um, vendors that are not delivering the services that they're promising. And once they don't get the service, then the HOA comes to us and says, well, can you get us out of this contract? And we look at it and we say, no, they didn't really even promise you that they would give you the services you think you were promised. So if it's a big ticket contract or really any important contract, uh, you should have the attorney look at it. Um, if a contract was awarded under the competitive bid procedures, um, the, the renewal of that contract is not subject to competitive bids. You don't have to go out for, to renew that contract for bids, um, but only if the contract contains a provision that allows the board to cancel the contract on 30 days notice. So that's why I said you need to really look at your renewal and your cancellation provisions. Um, so you, you can follow, you may follow, which is the actual word in the statute, you may follow the competitive bidding requirements that are in your governing documents if they're different than the statute, so long as the uh, competitive bidding requirements in your governing documents are more stringent or equal to the statute. The next section is fiduciary duty and basically freebies. What can you accept for free? Um, the general standards for directors, you're going to find that in Chapter 720, but also in Chapter 617. Uh, my guess is we don't have any for-profit corporation associations on the call today. Most of you are required to and have incorporated as a corporation not for profit, and that is governed by section or chapter 617 of the Florida statutes. So you have to really become familiar with 617 and 720. Those are two statute sections, two statute chapters of the Florida statutes that you want to become familiar with. However, there is a section of 617, the not-for-profit corporation statute that says if chapter 720 conflicts with chapter 617, then chapter 720 governs. Um, so both, both of those chapters will uh, remind you that you have obligations as directors in a position of trust. And that's really what fiduciary, when see people say you have these fiduciary duties, fiduciary um, implies a position of trust, but also a position of trust handling other people's money. So you are under 617 required to discharge your duties in good faith with the care of an ordinarily prudent person in the like position. Um, but the most important one is you're to discharge your duties um, in a manner that you reasonably, reasonably believe to be in the best interest of the corporation, meaning the association. So you don't get on the board to do what's in the best interest of yourself you do, you're on the board to do what's in the best interest of the corporation, the association as a whole. Um, in discharging your duties, of course, you have a right to rely on the information and opinions and reports and advice and financial statements that you get from your experts, your, um, your, your accountant, your attorney, your community, your licensed community association manager. Um, you, you can reasonably rely on what they are telling you, what they're presenting to you, unless you reasonably believe there's a reason you should not reasonably rely on them. So there's a reasonable reliance unless you know of something that should uh, make reliance on that person's advice unwarranted. As long as you're relying reasonably on these people's advice, then you're not liable for any action you take as a director when following that advice. Um, so another good reason to get your accountant or your um, attorney to give you an opinion letter that you can have in writing, you know, that we relied on the advice of counsel and that will greatly um, impact and lessen any liability on you as a director. Um, in section 720, uh, again, down at the bottom of the page, if you're following in the outline, section 3.2 of the outline, um, 
again, the officers and directors have a fiduciary relationship to the owners. You're dealing with their money. Um, under 720, your duties include, again, you know, acting in a reasonable manner, but also they're very cognizant in this statute about not accepting things from uh, people, from vendors, from people who provide services to associations um, to try to entice you to um, use their services. And so that part of the statute says that an officer or director or manager cannot solicit or accept any good or service for of value for which basically for which you have not paid. Um, it, and that applies to you or any member of your immediate family. You can't accept those things in, in from a person who is providing or proposing to provide goods or services to the association. I've actually run into this before where um, you know, a, a businessman from somewhere else in the country, retired, moved down here, got on the board and thought it was what everyone did, you know, offering favor to, you know, we'll give you the contract if you'll give me $500. That's so completely, totally illegal and you are immediately removed from the board if you do that. Um, the only thing you can, it does accept from that is if you're accepting food consumed at a trade show or a business meeting with one of these people, um, anything with a value of less than $25, you can't order the, you know, lobster flown in from Maine, but you can accept a meal from them or you can accept, you know, the things that are given out in connection with trade fairs and educational programs. If we were having one of these live, there might be a little mini trade show going on and you can, of course, pick up all your free goodies there and the, the statutes provides for that. If you are a director and you're charged with felony theft or embezzlement of the association's funds, you're immediately removed from the board. If those charges are later dropped, you can get back on the board. Uh, don't, don't get in that position whatsoever at all <laughs> because a felony is a crime and your association is not going to help you out there, neither will your insurance. Um, and speaking of insurance, the uh, statute requires you to have a contract for insurance, an insurance or a fidelity bond, um, naming all of the persons who have check signing abilities, all of the persons who deal with uh, funds, have custody of the association's money um, at any time. You can read all of that in 720-3033. Um, I don't know when I started, but I'll just, uh, I, I think we're about halfway through with this topic. Um, contracts with directors or officers, and, and this is the uh, proverbial conflict of interest statute. Um, if you own a cor corporation, you have an interest in a corporation or an entity, a company of some sort, or you sit on the board of some sort of an entity that wants to provide services or products to your association, and you also sit on the board of directors of your association, not a good idea, but if you do, uh, there is a way you can contract with your own association to provide those services, but you, there's a, a, a list of things you have to do, a lot of disclosure, a lot of uh, things out in the open that have to happen. Um, so you have to, you have to um, comply with sec statute 720 and 617, if you're going to uh, do business with your board and you also sit on your board. As you can probably tell, I don't advise it, but, but there's a way to do it. Um, if you are director of an entity or have an interest in an entity that wants to do business with your association and you sit on the board, you have to comply with two sections of 617 that we'll talk about in a second, but also uh, the contract has to be um, approved by two thirds of the directors present at the board meeting, excluding yourself. Um, and at the next regular meeting of your members, you must disclose the existence of this contract and the existence of the, the relationship with the director. And there's a, pr a, a mechanism for the members to vote to cancel that, uh, that contract. Also, the provisions of 617 that you must comply with are that you must disclose the relationship, uh, of course, to the board. Um, if the owners have any ability to 
uh, approve the contract, you must disclose it to them and let them vote on it if, it if it's a type of contract the members vote on. But then 617 says, or the contract must be fair and reasonable. Um, but on top of 617, you also have to comply with 720, which requires all those other disclosures, such as uh, disclosing it, the, the existence of the uh, contract and the relationship, the two thirds vote by the directors and the, re, um, the disclosing it at a member's meeting with the ability for the members to um, cancel the contract. Something that's become uh, talked about a lot, do at-large board directors still have fiduciary responsibilities? I'll answer that question right now. Someone, it, and I get a lot of questions about this because you have a board of directors and you have um, officers, president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, and then a lot of people, a lot of associations consider the other remaining directors to be at large. You are still all directors, um, even if you're not an officer. So yes, an at large board, uh, a director on a board still has all of these responsibilities, obligations and fiduciary duties. Um, as I was saying, a lot of questions have recently ar arisen on the association's emergency contract powers um, due to the pandemic, we are in a state of emergency. Unfortunately, the statute that deals with emergency powers of the board was really written, and we've discussed this in our list serves and in our uh, seminars, the attorneys that work in this area of the law, some of the attorneys on these uh, groups actually wrote this emergency uh, powers part of the law and they'll tell you it was written in contemplation of a natural disaster emergency such as a hurricane because we're in Florida and it actually uh, bloomed out of Hurricane Andrew, I believe. Uh, so this whole section on emergency powers, if you read it, it, it really applies to emergency powers in response to damage caused by an event for which a state of emergency is declared. And uh, there's a lot of back and forth as to whether the pandemic is damage caused by an event. If you read the whole statute, you see that it gives the board uh, emergency powers to contract without maybe going through the competitive bids or without maybe having a noticed board meeting, you know, it gives them the certain emergency powers to contract for like debris removal, um, a disaster plan for shutting off water. And, and you can see it's really meant for use after a storm. Um, as an aside, the there is one provision of the emergency powers um, provision of 720 that says, based on the advice of emergency management officials, the board may make any portion of the property unavailable. So a lot of my clients were asking during the pandemic, well, we're in a state of emergency and we still are. Um, so I, can I rely on CDC guidelines or the health department in closing my clubhouse, closing our um, common areas uh, by using this part of the statute. And uh, the DBPR in its um, wisdom had the same question. So in March, they came out with a directive that said, yes, we will make this section of the statute that deals with emergency powers, we'll make it apl applicable to the pandemic and we'll say that based on the advice of health department officials, uh, you may close any portion of your um, common areas. And we were like, great, that's great. But then they rescinded that, um, that directive. And now we're back to the plain reading and the plain meaning of the um, emergency powers provision of the statute. Might be worth taking a look at the emergency powers provisions of your own governing documents and beefing those up, um, making them apply to things such as a pandemic. Um, and section 617 also has emergency powers to contract, um, to have meetings without notices and things like that. But 617 defines an emergency as an emergency exists for purposes of this section if a quorum of the corporation's directors cannot readily be assembled because of some catastrophic event. So with 
such platforms such as we're on today, there's not, there's probably little chance that a quorum of your board cannot assemble. So I'm not sure 617 helps you much at all. Um, the last couple of parts of this are contracts with your community association manager. Uh, be aware of, and maybe, you know, in your spare time, read chapter 468, part eight, which deals with community association managers. The manager of a community association, which includes homeowners associations, must be a licensed community association manager, a licensed CAM under chapter 468. And the managers have, uh, there's a disciplinary arm of the DBPR that can discipline managers and disciplinary MAC actions will be taken if a manager, um, for purposes of our discussion in this portion of the, of the class today, if a manager contracts on behalf of the association with an entity that they have some sort of um, interest in or that they've received some sort of the K word kickback, you know, all of that is prohibited. Um, there are certain contracts that may have been entered into while your developer was in control. Um, the, the law basically says those contracts have to be fair and reasonable. And yes, there is litigation about what is fair and reasonable. <laughs> um, any communication services contracts for your cable, your internet, um, entered into by the board, and this is not in the outline. If you want to read it, it's 720.309 subsection 2, deals with communication services contracts and the ability of the members in certain circumstances to cancel communications contracts that the board may have entered into. There's also an explanation in your outline about construction contracts. As you probably all know, um, if you're getting if you're a, as a board contracting for some sort of um, construction or repair to be done on your property uh, by a licensed contractor that has a value greater than $2,500, they have to uh, give you a contract that has in all caps, the construction lien law notice, um, which tells you if you don't pay those vendors for that construction and those repairs, they can put a lien on your property and foreclose the lien. And lastly, I have the official records of the association. Um, Bill was talking a little bit about keeping official records and 720.303 as pertains to contracts states that part, as part of your official records, um, all contracts to which the association is a party, um, including your management contract, leases, things like that. And those are just plain old official records. You have to keep those for seven years. Also, when we started this conversation about bids, um, when you've accepted bids on contracts that must go out for bid, those bids received by the association must also be kept for one year. Um, there's also the catch-all provision of the association of the governing document statute that says all other written records related to the operation of the association. So it's a good rule to just keep all of your um, written uh, contracts, agreements, anything you have in writing that could be an official record, make it an official record. It, but I wouldn't be a lawyer if I didn't say excluding things that were attorney-client privileged. If you have advice from your attorney that is privileged or confidential, make sure you check with the attorney first before you turn it over as part of your official records. Did we have any more questions? There, there were a couple on the side, Mary, and I don't know if you answered them. This one's been up for a while, so you may have answered it. Um, thoughts on the process for comparing bids for painting of condo buildings so that we are comparing apples to apples. Uh, for example, make sure everything is written versus verbal. Yeah. <laughs> thoughts on the process for comparing. Bids this for one right here. Well, what you want, you'll want to do is get with some some of the professionals and get a, a an RFP, a request for proposal put together that has specs, and so that every bid you get has to comply with the specifications that you put out in your request for proposal, so that um, all the bids again, like you said, are apples to apples. Right. And someone asked the chapter that may allow canceling of a contract. Um, these are 
canceling of contracts that the developer may have entered into is 720.309. And in that same section, 720.309 is the discussion on communication services contracts, which um, you have to go to another statute to see what the definition of communication services is, but it's really internet, cable, any of those things. Um, there are certain circumstances where it can be canceled um, in 720.309 subsection two. And then if there's a conflict of interest contract entered into with a director, um, there are certain ways members could maybe uh, cancel that contract and that would be in 7.23033 and or in chapter 617.0832. There's one more, I don't know if you answered it. Do at large board of directors- yeah, I answered that one. Yeah, okay, all right. Are there any other questions for Mary? Um, Bill is back. They are doing work in his area. So we're gonna try to do the financial part of it. Um, and, and we'll see how it goes. So Bill, if you will turn on your audio and video and Mary, thank you so very much for stepping in. Sure. Okay. Well, Master you, Association you, Official Records, can you yes. take me through process for requesting them? There have been no master board meetings in the last seven months, website not up to date since 2016. Um, well. Bill was doing some some on records, but I can answer part of that. Your master association bylaws may not require a board meeting other than once a year, believe it or not. So you'll want to see if they're even violating anything by not having um, board meetings. But the official records requests for a master is the same as for any association. Um, I don't have the statute section on top of my head, but it would require a request in writing. Any association that gets a request for official records, all they have to give you is access to the official records. They don't have to go through the records and find the ones that you're asking for. They might do that for you, but uh, all the statute requires is that they give you access to the official records and access is described in the statute whether it be in person or on a computer or by a disc, there's, it's all explained in there. And I'll um, get my statute out and I'll post in the chat what the official records request statute is. Um, but it would be the same for a master association as it would for a sub. And if they haven't had a board meeting in the last seven months, they may not been required to, but you'll wanna look at the bylaws for that. There's one more question, guidance, and, and then after this question, um, we need to move on. Guidance on kinds of decisions that require board vote at an open board meeting as opposed to daily operating procedures that rely on general support agreement by the board. Okay, um, any board meeting you have is open except board meetings with the attorney to discuss pending or threatened litigation, board meetings um, with employees um, about their contracts. There might be one other thing, but I'm always concerned about the, if you're gonna have a closed board meeting, you gotta have the attorney there um, or very few other reasons to have closed board meetings. But the day-to-day -day operations should be about um, your manager and what he or she does in a daily operation. He, he or she takes policy decisions from the board, but handles the daily operations. There may be some approvals or check signing requirements that require the uh, treasurer or the president to work with the manager, um, but they can do those things daily. And I get this question a lot, and as a lot of it, and Bill can speak to it too, is case by case basis. If it's something that your manager who is licensed and knowledgeable knows should be done in an open board meeting, he or she will tell you. Uh, otherwise, if it's daily operations, you're not micromanaging the association. You're setting policy and, and big big things. The board, the manager is handling the day-to-day. -day. And about a board orientation meeting, you can have a board orientation meeting. It's an open meeting. You know, your members are allowed to come and it needs to be noticed. Um, and your, your manager could probably 
give you a good orientation meeting. Do you ever do those, Bill? I just got back. What was the last part about the? Uh, do you ever the do any kind of board orientation meetings for your individual boards? I mean, we of course recommend you come to these things that you're that right. you're at today. And there's another one of these with three different, um, three more different topics. So you'll want to try to catch that one too. For the board orientation meetings, we generally refer a certification class like this. Um, most of the times, the board members are reaching out or we discuss some of the items that are responsibility of a board during an open board meeting. But we don't really have a specific class, but that's actually kind of a good great idea. idea. That's a great idea to do. So, All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, Mary. Mary. Greatly appreciate it. All right, Bill, can I sign off or you want me to stand by? <laughs> If you uh, you can you can sign off if there's a problem with this portion uh, we're going to try to reschedule just this portion for the owners here on a, on a different day. All right, thank you. Thanks, Karen. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Mary. Talk to you soon. Okay. All right, Bill. I'm going to mute and stop my okay. video, but I'll keep monitoring and we'll see. Hopefully, we'll get through this next half hour. Yes. All right. So uh, thank you everyone for having me back out. And I apologize for the uh, internet service interruption that we're having in our area. Let me just say that um, paying for the most expensive internet provider or any vendor does not equate to um, perfect service. So we're finding that out today during this class. So the third topic that I was going to um, Topic number three, the second topic I was going to talk about was the financial requirements for our HOAs, budgets, reserves, and financial reporting. So let's start off by talking about the budget definitions. Um, if, you're, if you're following along in your outline, it's topic number three. So the first part of your budget is the operating expenses. Operating expenses can be a number of items that are listed that you're budgeting for. They can be the common area maintenance, common area maintenance for grounds, landscaping, tree trimming, a community center, uh, a playground for kids if you have that, a playground, a dog park, ponds, those natural areas, all of those items uh, would be uh, common area maintenance that you would have, sidewalks, road, you know, those sorts of things. So the insurance for all the common buildings and amenities, and um, we're going to talk about a couple of these things in details, but the insurance would be included for common buildings, common buildings and amenities. Other insurance types would be property, which is your common buildings, general liability, crime, umbrella, wind, your directors and officers, flood insurance, if applicable, and law and ordinance and equipment. So I want to talk just a little bit about a couple of these. The crime, when uh, taking over new associations, the crime portion of the policy is probably the least overlooked or the most overlooked uh, policy. This is very important. If you do not know if you have a crime policy, please contact your manager or your insurance agent to confirm that you have it. The crime, the crime policy protects the association's funds in the bank accounts. Now, it's not to be confused with insurance. Insurance, FDIC insurance, for each financial institution, not per account, but each financial ins um, institution, your insurance, your funds are covered up to $250,000. So if you have two accounts and they're both accounts at the same bank and both accounts, Oh, no, everybody. I'm really sorry about this. Um, I just don't know what we we can do. Let me ask all of you. I've got um, I've got 15 of you online here. Um, if we Bill, they're doing maintenance in his area, and that's why his Internet keeps going in and out. The financial portion is a pretty interesting portion of the program. 
would you guys be willing for me to reschedule it and um, do it again via Zoom? Um, maybe a, uh, tomorrow, um, tomorrow morning. Would that work for you? I don't know if Bill's available, but send me a chat and let me know um, how you feel about that. If you can't attend it, you're still going to get your certificate. Most people are, yes, there are a couple who can't. Wait a minute, Bill might be coming back on. Let's see. I'm sorry, Bill. Um, oh, I'm here. Okay, keep going. Um, All right. Sorry, guys. I just... Um, all right, so let's let's just keep moving. I don't want to. I'm gonna to try to get as much in as we can before uh, this uh, before this continues. So the crime insurance protects the association's funds in case there is a uh, fraudulent activity on the account. Generally, there is a deductible, but please check with your insurance agent and management company to determine if you have this coverage. Uh, the directors and officers. This type of insurance protects the board and their and the decisions that they make to prevent from being sued personally. So you definitely want to have this coverage. Here's two very important things about those two policies, the crime and the DNO policy. Please make sure that your management company and manager are listed in the coverage. There are many crime policies and DNO policies that are written from insurance carriers in the Florida market that are very inexpensive. And a lot of HOAs and condos choose those because they think they're doing a good job in, in selecting the least expensive option. Chances are your management company and the actions of your management company and manager are not included in the policy. It's very important that that information is in there. I cannot stress that enough because for one, most management company, um, most management contracts require that but it also protects the association for any decision that a management company or manager makes. So please make sure that information is that, that, that those two things are covered. Uh, common interest benefits such as cable and my favorite topic of the day, internet. So those are all common interest benefits that you have, backflow testing, those sorts of maintenance, ongoing maintenance. Um, those are all part of the operating expenses. Now, this, the second two items, reserves, or the reserves, is actually split up into two different sections. There's statutory reserves and non-statutory reserves. So I'm going to go ahead and explain the difference. The reserves per 720.303, subsection 6B, are reserves that have been established by the developer, a majority vote by the entire membership to approve the reserves, and those reserves can be fully funded or partially waived or 100% waived each year by a membership vote. So those reserves are required by law for you to fund. The board, if you have a turnover and you have documentation or proof that statutory reserves were not created or not required per your governing documents, and instead of having assessments or special assessments for future maintenance items, the board at its own discretion may include non-statutory reserves. Those, the statement, if you have non-statutory reserves, there is state, there is verbiage in 720.303, section 6, B and C, there is language that must be included on the budget indicating that it is non-statutory. So let's talk about the differences. The reserves for statutory, the required reserves, whether they're pooled or component funding, can only be used for reserve items. So pooled reserves means that you can use reserve funds for any item listed in your reserve study or items that are included in your reserve report. Component funding of the reserves means that if you have funds for a roof and you have funds for road replacement, you cannot use the funds from the roof replacement to pay for the roads and vice versa, unless you have a vote of the membership to enter transfer those funds so that you can use that. Non-statutory reserves can be used for any 
purpose whatsoever. They can be used for reserves. They can be used for maintenance obligation, a budget shortfall. The board can cancel the reserves at any time and move the funds back over to the operating account. So what you need to, if you're unsure of where you are, please contact your management company. If you're still unsure or if you are self-managed, please contact your attorney. They will help you just determine whether or not you have statutory or non-statutory reserve. So next item is when are you going to begin the budget preparation? So budget preparation really should begin in the summer at some point to at least begin having conversations with vendors and reviewing your current year status of a budget. So if you understand if a contract, a new contract was issued, your insurance premiums have gone up because you renew your insurance in the middle of the year. Those are items that you need to start planning for as to what that potential budget number must be for the upcoming year. So here are some things that you want to do when you begin preparing for your budget. One, review the documentation to your governing documents to determine how you can adopt your budget or what is required to adopt your budget. Some budgets require, whether it's an HOA or if it's an HOA, they you're not required to have a so-called budget meeting, but condo world, you are required. But some HOAs require a special budget meeting. Just need to review the bylaws to determine if you have any requirement to host a meeting for them. Start planning in the summer. You wanna start talking to your current vendors. This is a good time to read for the board and the property manager, or the association manager to re review the work that's been done already in the community. Talk about future projects that may be upcoming before the end of the budget season. If there's a surplus, any projects you wanna use or get done before the end of the year. Then you want to have a meeting or you know have a preparation and meeting with your manager and your treasurer to begin the process of putting all those items together in a draft form for your budget. And then, as I stated just a minute ago, your finance committee meetings. If you have a committee that is meeting to discuss, all committees um, they do not have to be posted. But when you're talking about budget, it's always a good thing that if the finance members are going to meet someplace, to at least post a notice for the owners to have them become engaged in that budgeting process. But with that said, budget approvals is a board vote. It is not a membership vote. I just want to state that. It is not a membership vote. It is a board vote. Unless the required reserves, the statutory reserves, if the committee or the board want to put forth a proposed budget that has reduced funding for the required reserves or waive it altogether, that must be approved by the owners at a membership meeting prior to the board's adoption of a budget. Because you, don't, you do not want five members of a board reducing the amount needed to fund the reserves at 100% or 80% without permission from the owners, because when you reduce the funding for the reserves, that does open up a possibility of having, reduces the pos or increases the possibility of having special assessments throughout the year and the years to come. That's why they leave it up to the owners to do that. So now we wanna review the capital assets that you have, generally speaking of your reserves. So you wanna talk about the each value to replace roofs, Concrete sidewalks, if you're responsible for that. Roadways, if you're responsible for that. Roofs, if you're responsible for that. Windows in the pool cabana, pool equipment, all of those items, you wanna start putting all of those, all of that information together. Then you wanna talk about the useful or determine the useful life of the asset. Some of that can be done by contacting a vendor that you're currently working with that can help you determine that. And so you, if you're putting together your own reserve funding, that is what you need to have how much life you have left. So if your useful life of your, say your heat, let's say your heat pump for your pool, the uh, useful life is 15 years, how many years do you have left? That can be easily determined if you know when, that, when the heat pump was installed, and then it's just determining how many years you have left. The balance in your reserve fund at the end of the year, or what you're proposed, or what you anticipate having left over in the reserve fund at the end of the year. 
So if you're halfway through the year and you know that you have to put $100 more in your reserve account for your required contributions, but yet you have $50 in anticipated replacement costs before the end of the year, then whatever your balance is on July 1st, you know that you'll need to add $50 to that to show where you're going to be at the end of the year for your total funds. It's always nice when you're contacting your vendors to get estimates from for the replacement of any maintenance item that's included in your reserves. So if your roofs are required to be replaced by the association, then contact one of a, a, a vendor, uh, preferably a roof vendor from CAI. Most of the time they come out and do a free assessment on the roofs. We'll determine the quality of quality of the roof, how much time you have left, and any replacement costs that may intend. So if you are anticipating replacing your roofs within five years, then the vendor, the contractor, should be able to give you an, a budget number to at least put in the reserves to begin funding. So that would be if the association or the board members and treasurer would be putting all of that information together. I recommend all of our associations we manage to get a reserve study completed by an, en an engineer. So you have several vendors that are members of CAI that provide reserve studies. They're going to send, a, if you decide to do this, which helps you get more of an accurate number of what's needed for your budget. So if you contact one, they're going to send you a list of questions. The list of questions will be which items are included in reserve. How often are they maintained? When were they installed? When was the last time service was done? How much are you in pooled reserves or component funding? How much funds are in each item? All of the items that we previously discussed, your reserve specialist is going to put that or ask that and then put that together in a chart in a report and tell you that in the budget year 2021, in 2022 and 2023, you need to put this amount of money from your reserves into the into the from the operating budget into the reserve budget. If the membership, as we discussed earlier, that you want to waive your funding of let's say your contribution for the year is $100, and in order to make the budget correct or to control costs, the association decides they're going to fund at 80%. That would mean that you're contributing $80 for the year to your reserve fund. Then in order to do that at a membership meeting, then you must have the membership approve that. The majority of the owners approve the reduced funding of the reserve. So once you have all that information, that's for the reserves, your operating costs, statutory, non-statutory reserves, then you can take that information and start putting it into your draft form to circulate amongst the other board members the finance committee, if you're using a finance committee, and then you can even have workshops for the owners to attend. If you're anticipating an increase or a large increase in your budget contribution for the next year, that would be a good time to have workshops with your owners to start beginning how you got to that number, the process you used, how you came up with that number, and offer their guidance or their opinions on how to proceed with the budget moving forward. So the last thing, that you may need for your budget will be insurance coverage for your appraisals. So in your HOA, if you have guardhouses, if you are responsible for the exterior of the buildings for the homes that are in, there are villas and they're in HOA and you're required to pay insurance. If you, those, your insurance agent will be requesting an appraisal or an updated appraisal, which is required in the condo world every three years. And that should be done also for your HOA. So you just contact an appraisal, your insurance agent um, will help guide you or give you recommendations as to who to call and your insurance costs and your premiums are based directly on the appraised values that are showing up in your, uh, in your report. So when you're selecting an insurance agent, it's very, uh, most, most people believe that you can get quotes from many, from several different agents, and that's not necessarily the case. What you want to do is interview several different insurance agents, and then select the one that you feel has the most experience and the most quali the more qualifications to go out and seek quotes from the insurance markets. The insurance markets refer to insurance companies that provide insurance. 
So there are a few in the area. Most of you probably know these names, Heritage Insurance, Coastal Insurance, um, Xena for your crime ballot policies and workers' comp policies. Those are just to name a couple that you have. But once an insurance company or an agent gets a quote from a market or an insurance company, the insurance company will not provide any other quotes to any other agent. So it's very difficult to have insurance agents provide you with different quotes. So just select one and then move forward with that one to get you the best rate. When you're selecting an insurance agent, you wanna make sure that they also have knowledge of the Florida statutes, all of the available markets and all of the rates. That will help obviously them, the more that they know, the better rates that they can get from the insurance carriers. Then they, the insurance agent, will then be able to make recommendations to the board and the members based on the assessment of exposure that you have for each one of the items that you're insuring, whether it's property coverage, crime, your um, workers comp if you're required to have that or if you want to carry that, those sorts of things, they're gonna make recommendations. Then it's up to the board to decide how much risk you're willing to take on versus how much premium you're willing to pay for. And your insurance agent and association manager will be able to help you move through them. Um, so mitigation inspections. So if you are responsible for roofs or roof replacements, then your insurance company will require you to have a wind mitigation reports. I'm sure even for your personal properties that you have, wind mitigation is, a, is a, an inspection that's done where they go into the attic and determine how the roof is attached to the structure. And based on their findings, will determine whether or not you get insurance credits for the types of wind mitigation that you have on your roof. So the last thing we wanna talk about before we get to some questions, I see some questions beginning to pop up, is the financial reporting. So first, your management company, your CPA, or your bookkeeper should be providing you with monthly reports. Your monthly report, your financial package every single month, that should include a balance sheet, a p l statement. Your p l statement can be broke down by the current period that they're reporting on and then also provide a year to date. There's another report that can be included, which is your p l statement compared to your budget. This is a great tool for board members to be able to see how much they've spent, how much of the budget they've spent, what percentage they have left. They can use that number to determine any other special projects that they want to approve throughout the year. You'll have a delinquency report in there, in your, in your packet. You'll also have a bank report. You'll, you can have a checks um, deposit, checks and deposit report, which shows all of, the, and all of the actions done on your bank report. And then obviously you have your bank statements and the reconciliation statements included in your packet. One thing that you could ask your management company to do is to provide two different sets of packages for your monthly reporting. One that goes to the board, which includes the delinquency report, as well as your bank statements. The other report that you can get is one for your homeowners. So we obviously don't wanna share bank statements with everybody in the association, nor necessarily share the delinquent report to the neighbors. Uh, so you just don't wanna show that information. So you can remove those items from the financial report and then offer that as the owner's version of the financials. So there are a couple of different things that you must do at the end of the year to report to the members how your finances were for the pre previous year. So if your association has less than $150,000, then the only thing that's required from your treasurer, bookkeeper, accountant, management company is to provide a cash receipts and expenditures report, which is basically just a P&L statement and a balance sheet and that can just be sent out to the owners to summarize the previous year. If, you're, if your association has a assess or a budget that's totaling between $150,000 and $300,000, that must be compiled by a certified public, ac public accountant. Just ask your management company and they'll be able to provide you for recommendations for independent CPA to come in and review that. The 300,000 to 500,000 reviewed financial statement. This is the next line of uh, in-depth reporting and review of the previous year. That can be done by a CPA as well, 
or should be done by a CPA. If your association has more than $500,000 in assessments for the year, then you need to have an audited by an independent CPA. Now, there are two things that the owners can vote on. And owners can vote 20% or 20% of the owners can petition the board to increase the level of the financial review. And then the board may reduce the level with a majority vote present at a membership meeting. So the owners have, you can determine as an owner to increase or decrease the level of financial review, but you can only do that for three years until you have to follow the state mandated financial reporting at the end of the year. So that's really all I have. I know there's a bunch of questions. Karen is back with us. And yep. um, so I'll answer some questions for you. Go right ahead. Okay, first question. How frequently do you feel a reserve study is necessary? Okay, so that's a great question. I think it, at a minimum, I believe every three years, um, there's no requirement for you to do so. There's no requirement, but every three years at a minimum, but it could be more often depending on how many capital improvements you've done or how much money you've spent from the reserves. So if you have a reserve study the very next year, you paint your buildings, you replace your roads, you do all of that, that following year is actually a great time to reset your contribution levels because now you've spent all the money, now you need to make sure that you're set for the next 15 or 30 year cycle and that's a good time to have that done. Okay. Does CAI specifically list third-party appraisal vendors? Um, you can go to the CAI website and you can take a look at the membership report. And as a uh, plug for CAI, there's also a phone app that you can download as well. And uh, you can go through there and they have appraisals, uh, appraisal companies that are listed and reserve study companies that are also members of CAI. We've got all of our vendors listed on our vendor um, directory on the homepage of our website. And it's um, www.caiwestflorida.org. Um, why not a cash flow report? Well, the cash flow report is a way to do that, but most management companies do not provide a cash flow report. There is a cash flow report option that most of our softwares provide, but that can absolutely be included in any monthly or end of the year uh, financial reporting. You said we should be getting these monthly reports. What if we are not? <laughs> well, Nancy, thanks for your question. I'm not sure if you're asking that as a homeowner or if you are asking that as a board member. So let me take both. As a board member, you should be receiving monthly reports because you need to have that information to help you determine how to move forward for the next year or for the next month in the, in the subsequent months leading up to the end of the year. If you're a homeowner, they may very well be available. You just have to ask your management company or board member to provide you with the financial reports. They don't just send out a, re, um, a notice saying that their um, your monthly reports are ready for the homeowners, but that is something that you're allowed to request. And what you one more thing is that you can also, Nancy, or anybody on the call, is request if you have a website and a private side of the website or secure side of the website, you can make a request of your board and your management company to post the owner version of the packets on the website. So that way you can just go there all the time. Okay. Oh, and she's talking about a master association. Um, there's really no requirement that you're to get a month, a monthly financial packet. But I've read the I've read the statutes. I don't see anywhere where it's required that you have a monthly report. But everybody has a monthly report. You just have to call and talk to um, your management company or whoever is handling your your books or your record keeping to make sure that they are providing the monthly reports. Are there any other questions for Bill before we conclude the session? Thank goodness we we got through it without. <laughs> It was frustrating, yeah. you know, Bill. It is. Yeah. It happens. It was, uh, again, I just want to apologize to everyone for the uh, service interruptions. Um, I know it's a little junky or clunky getting through this, and uh, but I appreciate all of your patience to uh, let me come back on. Well, and with that being said, I don't see any more questions. So Bill, thank you so much. Wait, yeah, thank you for the information. Great. So.
Um, thank you everyone for joining. We really appreciate it. I will be sending the certificates out. So okay. have a wonderful day. Talk to you all later. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone.